In this episode of Scaling Postgres, we talk about adopting PGCAT, time bins, work mem settings, and bad constraints. I'm Creston Jameson, and this is Scaling Postgres, episode 257. All right, I hope you, your friends, family, and coworkers continue to do well. Our first piece of content is Adopting PGCAT, a next-gen Postgres proxy. This is from tech.instacart.com, and they're talking about a new connection pooler called PGCAT. And it does a little bit more than connection pooling. It also does load balancing and replica failover. Now, what's significant about this is that this is a not insignificant company, Instacart, is starting to use and has contributed improvements to PGCAT. So historically, I've always used PG Bouncer, but I'm really interested in this post here with all the information that they provide. So they were using PG Bouncer, but they wanted to get that load balancing and replica failover capability. So they started doing an evaluation using a table similar to this, where they looked at PG Bouncer, PG Bouncer with a sidecar to handle failover, Yandex Odyssey, as well as PGCAT. And as you would expect with these types of <laughs> tables, PGCAT was a yes in all the categories with regard to being multi-threaded, which is great because that's one thing I don't necessarily like about PG Bouncer is that it is single-threaded. So if you put it on a multi-core machine, you're only going to be using one CPU core. And you have to do different techniques to actually use all of those cores if you want a dedicated PG Bouncer box. Whereas PG Cat is multi-threaded out of the box, so it'll immediately use whatever cores are available, which is awesome. The other thing it has is PG Bouncer controls. So PG Cat is meant as a drop-in replacement for PG Bouncer. So you can use tools such as reload or show the pools so those commands work in PG Cat. Again, that's awesome. It supports a replica failover and query load balancing, which is the things they were most interested in, as well as has some different behavior for handling poorly behaved clients. Then they also list the language here, and as you can see, the other ones here listed are written in C and C++, whereas PGCAT is written in Rust. So they talked about their evaluation phase, and they first looked at uh, latency. So what kind of performance are they getting out of it? And it was pretty much identical. I mean, it wasn't quite as fast as PG Bouncer, but very, very minimal difference. Like statistically, they're maybe no difference at all for some of these. So the performance is good. Oh, the other thing I should mention is that one of the key differentiators for PG Cat is that it does support the session and transaction modes that PG Bouncer does as well. We talk a little bit about their deployment layout and how you can use it simply for a proxy in front of a Postgres instance, as well as what they're doing here where they're using a containerized deployment of PG Cat where the traffic can speak to any of the databases here and load balance between them. And they said they used random load balancing as well as least connection load balancing, I believe. And how it can handle replica failover so it can stop traffic to a replica until it comes back online. And in terms of the misbehaving clients, they say with a PG Bouncer, it normally just breaks the connection, whereas PG Cat actually does a rollback and is able to add the connection back to the connection pool. And they say here, a quote, PG Cat has been in use for some of our uncharted production workloads for the past five months. So definitely a lot of production usage here. And that they've, quote, uh, migrated one of their largest databases to PGCAT and has yielded significant benefits by adding load balancing services. And they're in the process of moving more of their production workloads to PGCAT as well. And the last thing they uh, say in the last paragraph here is PGCAT is targeting a 1.0 release in the coming weeks. So again, like I mentioned, PG Bouncer has been my go-to, but PG Cat looks pretty interesting to me now, and I'm probably going to be looking at it and evaluating it in the near term. And so if this is of interest to you, definitely check out this blog post, as well as the GitHub page for PG Cat, which the tagline is PostgreSQL at petabyte scale. Next piece of content, easy PostgreSQL time bins. This is from crunchydata.com. And they're talking about when you're analyzing data, you want to bucket it or bin it to do a histogram of sorts to see how many values are in a particular bucket or a particular bin. And that's what they're doing here. So they're using earthquake data published by the USGS. So they created a table to accept it. They're using PostGIS to get the geometry data type, as well as they're using PLPython because they're using their technique of using a Postgres function to actually pull all the data in and format it and place it in the table. You don't need 
this to do the binning. This just basically pulls the data that they're going to be analyzing. And at the end, they had just over 11,000 records there. And they did a quick query just to show you the magnitudes of the earthquake and how many counts were reported. So that's a very quick way to do a type of binning by magnitude of the earthquake. But then they go into more histogram-based summaries based upon the date. So you want to see how many magnitude 6 earthquakes happened on particular days or particular weeks. So the first simple way to do it is just to cast the timestamp as a date, and you immediately get the data that looks like this. Now, of course, the disadvantage is it doesn't show the zero counts. So as you can see, it's skipping dates. And ideally, if you're wanting to graph something, you are going to want to show all the dates and zeros where there is no data. So how you can handle that is you could do a join to a generate series command that generates all the dates and then use the coalesce function. The count is null to just make it zero. And then you get consistent dates zeros where no data is present, and then the actual data where it is present. Then they got a little bit more sophisticated, and this requires a Postgres 14 to do it, but there's a date bend function. So basically this allows you to set how much you're stepping by date range. So in this case, they use the date bend function to bend their dates by 2.5 days. And of course, when they do the generate series, they do it in 2.5 day steps. And as you can see, each point is 2.5 days and it is binning appropriately. Then they say, okay, now you can do it arbitrary bins of any size. And to do this, first they create an array aggregate of a generate series command, and they're actually using one week intervals. But again, you can make this one month intervals, whatever interval you want. Then you select from the quakes table and you do a cross join to that array aggregate. And then you use the width bucket function. And basically it takes that timestamp and looks in that bin for the appropriate range to use as the data. And you get something like this. So it is in the appropriate bin and you get the count, but you're not getting the actual week or date range, nor are you showing all the bins. So with the next iteration, he does a join that nests all of the bins and uses with ordinality as well as the coalesce function for the count to be able to show every bin or every week along with the count and handling zeros as well. So it gives you a properly formatted histogram. So this was a great blog post about how to bin data in different ways using Postgres. So if you're interested in that, definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content, everything you know about setting work mem is wrong. So that's the perspective of this post. Every single one is wrong. The reason being is that he says work mem is mostly workload dependent. So you want to set it high enough so that you're not doing disk merges, but you don't want to set it high enough you're going to run out of memory. So his perspective, the best thing to do is use a formula similar to this. So take 50% of the memory, add your file system buffers, and divide that by the number of connections to your database. So with that, the chance you're going to run out of memory is relatively low, but the issue is that you also may be leaving memory on the table because it's not gonna be utilized. So then his recommendation is to basically empirically test it. So use that formula and then set your log temp files to zero and run the system on a production load. If everything works fine, you see no performance problems, you are pretty much done. But if you are seeing a performance issue, then you look for temporary file creation messages. If there aren't any, you should be done. And it's not temporary file creation, but if there are, his recommendation is setting the work mem to two times the largest temporary file. But again, you want to be careful of that because you don't want to run out of memory and you don't want something ridiculous like he says here around two terabytes. <laughs> then he has another recommendation. If you really need to use a formula to do it, taking average freeable memory times four divided by the max connections. Now, one thing I will say here is that another thing that you could do, he doesn't really list here, is leverage the fact that you could set work memory per session or per user. So for example, if you have a web application and most of the interactions, the data that people are pulling are super fast queries, maybe you're looking for a few records at a time, you don't need a large work memory. So maybe for the user that the web application connects to doesn't need a very large work memory. Whereas if you had a reporting infrastructure, maybe use a different Postgres user for that and increase its work memory for that user or for that session you're connecting to the database as. So that way each connection type gets its own custom work memory for the job that it needs to do to hopefully try to minimize some of the disk access. But if you want to learn more, definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content, breaking your PostgreSQL database with bad check constraints. This is from cybertech-postgresql.com. They're talking about a situation where you can set up a constraint 
that actually gets you into trouble. So ideally, you want your check constraint to be immutable because it can cause problems when it is mutable. Now, Postgres has some facilities to prevent immutable functions, for example, where they're not supposed to be present. But the problem with check constraints is that capability needs to be there for cases when you're doing a check constraint, checking a timestamp, for example. So you want to enforce some sort of constraint with the date you're putting in, and you want to use the current date to evaluate that. Well, by definition, this is a mutable function. It's going to have different inputs every day, but can still be a valid check constraint. So you don't want to enforce immutable expressions in your check constraints, but you still need to be careful how you handle it. And they show some cases here of how it can break things. So the first example is where they are keeping a history of data entered into a database. So a change was made to their table called data, and it stores the row information casted to text. And it handles that by doing a trigger. So it takes all the row data, casts it to text to store it in the column in a trigger that updates that history table. And then they have a check constraint on that history table that says is not null. But they have a comment here that says, never mind that is not null, the typecast is actually the test. So when they insert data and then delete data, you can see their table history has been updated. But when they add a column to the data table and then try to update that data, you get an error, malformed record literal and the detail is too few columns. So basically you have a data mismatch because of that additional column that you've added to that table. So he says a better solution would have been a trigger to be able to handle this. The other issue that they talk about a bad check constraint is where you have dependencies between tables. So they have vehicles and clients and they're going to be renting these vehicles so they set up an exclusion constraint in the rented table, and they create some functions to be able to add the check constraint to make sure that the number of seats in the car matches the group of people who are going to be renting the car. They inserted some data. You get an error when you have a violation of this check constraint, but your data gets inserted correctly when the check constraint is not violated. So everything looks good. But the problem is when you do a backup and then do a restore, because of the ordering of the restore, you can actually run into errors. Because you have dependencies between tables, it may restore in an improper order that can result in this issue. And again, their solution for this again is to use triggers to do it. So I definitely encourage you to check out this blog post to go into more detail about reasons why that these fail and some alternatives, but it definitely enforces the fact you need to be careful when using check constraints and ideally only use immutable expressions in them. And the only probably safe mutable ones are, again, the timestamp example that they show here. But if you want to learn more, check out this blog post. Next piece of content, inside logical replication in PostgreSQL, how it works. This is from postgresql.fastware.com. And this is a great post exploring how logical replication works in Postgres 15 and all of the different features. And they go through the process of setting it up. They show you the different tables you can look at to examine the state of it. They cover the subscriber side, the publisher side, showing the replication launcher and talking about the table workers and apply workers. They talk about the new features to be able to filter things based upon row filters and column lists. So this is a really comprehensive post, and I definitely encourage you to check it out if you want to learn more about how logical replication works. Next piece of content, system roles. What? Why? How? This is from Depeche.com. And this is a pretty interesting post because he's listing all of the system roles and shows the version in which they were introduced. So these are essentially groups that you can add users to. They exist by default in every version of Postgres that's listed here. So for example, if you wanted to give someone read all access to all databases on a Postgres instance, as long as you're on Postgres 14 or higher, you could just add them to the group PG read all data. So he goes over each of these different roles and shows an example of their use case. So if you're interested in that, definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content, how collation works. This is from petereisentrout.org, and he's going into a deep dive on explaining how collations work with some specifics on Postgres. Now, I know that they made some changes to Postgres 15 with regard to ICU collations, and I'm super interested to see what's coming in Postgres 16 now. And he does promise to do that in a future blog post, so we'll have to be on the lookout for that as well. Next piece of content, the wonders of Postgres logical decoding messages. 
This is from InfoQ.com. And they're talking about how you can use application tools to actually read the wall stream and logically decode it. But specifically, this blog post discusses how you can actually emit your own messages from Postgres using the PG logical emit message. And this message doesn't have to do anything with the data contained within Postgres. It could be totally custom what you're emitting. So usually you're logically decoding data changes in Postgres, but with this emit message, you can emit anything you want. So they talk about that here and they talk about the infrastructure they set up for decoding it. Primarily they're using the Bezium as their change data capture tool and a stream processing tool like Apache Flink. They talk about some of their use cases for using this setup and that's for auditing metadata, application logging and microservices data exchange. And the key thing to keep in mind as you're looking at this is that this PG logical emit message, there's no fixed schema for these messages, basically, if you're going to start using this, you're going to have to have your own contract with what data you're sending out so that you know how to receive it. But this was a very comprehensive blog post. So if you're wanting to get more detail about it, definitely check out this piece of content. Next piece of content, UUIDs versus serial for primary keys. What's the right choice? This is from pganalyze.com. And this is the next episode of Five Minutes of Postgres. And Lucas covers the article that was done by Christoph Pettis, and we covered it a few weeks ago on scaling Postgres, whether should a UUID be a big int or the primary key. So he goes into more detail about this, talking about Christoph's perspective. He also reviews how performance can vary between random versus sequential identifiers, as well as talks about the new UUID type version 7 that may be coming that has a, I believe, a time sequential component to it. So maybe that could be a really good solution. And how there is a talk on the Postgres mailing list, I believe, about potential implementation as well. So if you're interested in that, check out this piece of content. Next piece of content, PostgreSQL patch of interest to me, documentation linking. This is from softwareandbooze.com. And this actually isn't a Postgres change, but a change to Postgres's documentation where they actually show visible links for the individual segments of documentation that you can link to for discussion purposes. So I've actually had to use this a few times, so I'm super interested in this actually getting pushed live into the next version of the documentation. But if you want to learn more about this, definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content, building an AI-powered chatbot using Vercel, OpenAI, and Postgres. This is from neon.tech. And this post covers a lot of technology, but specifically with regard to Postgres, they're talking about the PG vector extension and being able to use it for storing embeds from OpenAI's API. So if you're wanting to use AI with Postgres, maybe you'd be interested in checking out this blog post. Next piece of content, there was another episode of Postgres FN this week. This one was on upgrades, where they say they discuss what they are, how often they come out, and how regularly we should be upgrading. Check out their show on YouTube or via the audio link if you're interested. Ah, and I see they're now embedding the YouTube videos as well, so great. Next piece of content, the Postgres Scroll Person of the Week is Vincent Picabe. If you're interested in learning more about Vincent and his contributions to Postgres, definitely check out this blog post. And the last piece of content, we did have another episode of the Rubber Duck Dev Show this past Thursday afternoon. This one was on features your editor or your IDE should have with Amir Rajan. So Amir had a very specific set of requirements for the editor that he chose. And I think these are requirements that we should all consider in choosing our IDE or editor. So if you want to listen to that discussion, we welcome you to check out our show. That does it for this episode of Scaling Postgres. You can get links to all the content mentioned in the show notes. Be sure to head over to scalingpostgres.com where you can sign up to receive weekly notifications of each episode. Or you can subscribe via YouTube or iTunes. Thanks.